Okay, week two of Dr. Chuckalingham's class. Take it away, Dr. Chuckalingham. Thanks so much, Jennifer and Osher, for organizing this. It's a pleasure to meet with uh, so many friends to talk about uh, how consciousness and our lives are connected with our long past and with our exciting future. So today we will discuss, as the second of this uh, four-week series, super artificial intelligence. So let me share my screen. I'm hoping it is full screen now. Not yet. Is it full screen? Not, Not yet. yet. Uh, if you could, uh, we did it before, uh, just a minute ago, before class started. You want to swap the presenter? Yeah. Huh. It worked before, Dr. Chocolingham. Hi, Kay. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, thank you. Today's discussion in our four week series is about super artificial intelligence, exploring singularity and its immediate implications. So I'm gonna thank my son who did this work last year, Kevin. He is now in Stanford doing uh, engineering in uh, artificial intelligence, that's what his passion is. And uh, he did this work about going beyond human consciousness, whether artificial intelligence might ever be able to uh, exceed human uh, awareness and uh, uh, freedom of uh, will. So this is what the questions were. At what point will machine intelligence surpass human intelligence? And that is what is defined by this word singularity. It's still a theory, but it might happen. What it is, is a point, you might see the red line, this human intelligence, which has taken several million years to evolve to where it is. Only in the last 200,000 years have we been around as a homo sapiens human being species. But our intelligence started several million years ago to gradually keep evolving. And our intelligence continues to grow, which is good. But now we have this green line that started around 50, 60 years ago, and it is growing rapidly. This green line is computer's intelligence. So that's what we want to focus on. There is a point where we feel it will become as intelligent as humans. That point is called singularity. And then uh, it's not going to stop. It's only going to keep accelerating, not just growing. So the, it might far, far exceed human intelligence. So that point where it touches our intelligence is singularity. We'll stop right here. Anyone has any thoughts, questions? Strong opinions about how this is going to be or not be. You'll have to unmute yourself because uh, I think guys, I want to remind you that you may uh, unmute yourself or you may put questions in chat. Thank you. It's scary. It is very scary. I mean, because. Um, we could become servants to the computers. In some ways we are anyway, but. <laughs> we are addicted to it, but we are still able to turn it off if we don't want to. That's true. With that several true. points in our history, we came across similar things. First time we domesticated wolves to be dogs or uh, horses for transport. Horses were faster than us, but we choose to get on them and travel faster than our legs would carry us. So in some ways, the horse was more capable in speed and distance. But uh, we decided to take the risk to get on it, even if some of our ancestors broke their necks and lost their lives. Others succeeded in taming them over generations. People 
don't lose that much lives while working with uh, young horses anymore and uh, it went on for a thousand years until something faster than the horse came around which is the car now in the last 100 years we can still choose to get you know horse and travel wherever we want to go but it's just far far more efficient to just get into a car and transport ourselves to whichever other state we want to go so this is just out of our convenience and better choices proved to be safer we adopt it but the horse or the car may not compare in the intelligence of the computer once it reaches the singularity point so that is really a major uh, uh, shift in our emphasis so that particular junction we've never had to face so i invited my mom to join from india i think she just might have come on so, hello mom this is the first uh, slide that we are discussing the what is singularity singularity is the point where computer intelligence which is the green line touches human intelligence it's not yet there we are in 2020 somewhere here and in the next few decades we might find a computer that is as smart as human beings so that point is called singularity if it will happen or whether it may happen we don't know but uh, many people think it will so the next question is how do we recognize consciousness itself dr so, chakalingam i just want to make sure that you do know that there are some chats that have come in no see the way i set it up I, although i have two screens i don't see a single chat so if you can uh could uh, you go up to the top yes. of your no i see it now i see it since you okay, told fantastic. me fantastic yeah when do they predict that humans will meet singularity which year yes i have a slide on that i feel the devices are already conditioning us to obey our function in the manner they require so this is very very insightful and this is what we're going to talk about with uh, the next uh, several slides so thanks for uh, setting us up for the next few slides so this is what the challenges and uh, we need to find ways to address it so if you notice more comments please uh, let me know jennifer somehow i don't see it pop up automatically so what is consciousness itself there are scientifically two ways to look at it to explore consciousness learning reasoning remembering all of that can be considered and then there is this hard problem of consciousness we can look at it as access consciousness which is functional and phenomenal consciousness which is experience or qualia and uh, how we experience everything that we come across in life so if there is a input like a uh, thunder our response is to go indoors right because we don't want to be caught in a uh, thunderstorm and risk our life so we go into the house so that has protected us uh, to find in our shelter when the weather outside suddenly gets uh, dangerous so that stimulus has a response and that is uh, access consciousness what is this uh, phenomenal consciousness so this initial thing we feel is a easy problem that computers might be able to quickly recognize and learn how to address but the tougher challenge hard problem of consciousness ends up being the qualia or the experience of uh, things the first level is to recognize face which a computer is doing that's why the iphone opens only for me if somebody else tries to unlock my iphone it doesn't recognize the face it doesn't open for others so that it already is able to recognize and the next level is access consciousness reasoning and thinking which is the next step and the final step may be metacognition understanding thinking itself self monitoring and be able to introspect so these are all huge quantum leaps that uh, scientists believe the computer will be able to probably accomplish in the next few decades luckily none of us had to worry about it we all were born with all those skills because we are born human although we may love our pets to death our dog may not reach this level of consciousness our uh, cat may not be able to reach that level of consciousness 
So what is this strong artificial intelligence? When it is at the C2 level and fully conscious with metacognition, able to think about what it is thinking, that is what it is, and making that choice. So another graph looking at the same thing. Currently, we are down here, narrow artificial intelligence, which is the basic level. Here we have uh, Siri in the iPhone, Alexa, and uh, Cortana. These are all machine learning tools where uh, they are able to perform specific tasks at an amazing level. So people's lives is becoming much, much easier already because we just don't have to open and even go into the internet, just ask the, hey Siri, what is the temperature like today or this week, is there going to be any rain? So we can plan our day so much better. It can uh, help navigate to wherever we are going. So this is where we are. With We are already experiencing the benefits over the last 10 years of artificial narrow intelligence. The next level is general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, where machines are so intelligent that they are comparable to human beings. Once they become self-conscious, that is what is artificial superintelligence, ASI, and uh, that we may not be able to comprehend. See, we know our car, uh, we know our bicycle, we may be able to bike at 10, 15 miles an hour speed. If we get in our car and we are in a hurry, we may go at 80, 90 miles an hour to get to St. Louis. So we know what the car is capable of. But this machine, once it becomes super intelligent, we may not know what its capacity is, what it is thinking, <laughs> whether it is even in, uh, for our well-being. It doesn't have to choose that way. So that is the scary part of super artificial intelligence. So this is where we are, still in the later stages of narrow artificial intelligence. So this is the Mavericks paradox. Mavericks, what he discusses is a huge challenge for the computer. And what the challenge is, is beautifully summarized here. When, the, when we are trying to use the computer, the computer can easily figure out which national park the pictures were taken at. But then it, to say if the photo is that of a bird, then it takes several more years of training the computer to recognize that. Why is this? Because just by uh, understanding where the photo was taken using GPS coordinates, it's able to say it's a national park. But then to say if it is a bird or an animal, then it has to do so much more recognition. And then to go to next further levels, it becomes harder. Another example of this Mavrex paradox is uh, the ability of the computer to play the game chess. It's been already 15, maybe even 20, 25 years. In 1997, I think the computer beat good chess players. How good? The best in the world, the top players in chess could not beat the computer in 1997. So what do you think in 2027? Do you think a human being will be able to beat the computer again? If a 97 computer was good enough, 2027 computer is going to be a thousand times better. Now they are using machine learning tools that were not available in 97. Already that computer was good enough for the best human beings. Now computers are able to uh, play other games which are way more complex than chess. So that's where things are moving. This Mavericks paradox says playing chess or making such uh, intellectual decisions, computers can learn faster, but to walk or to bike or to swim or to uh, go and experience the fragrance of the spring weather compared to the gloomy winter day. So that sort of experiential differences the computer will take way longer. So what we assume for granted, which we've learned over millions of years as instinct or intuition, it's going to take a long time for the computer to master. But uh, our new things like driving a car, which it it already is doing very well, or playing chess, all these things, it's finding much, much easier. Okay, so that is the Mavarex paradox. What we humans think is easy, it finds it hard. Whereas what we are taking 20, 30 years to master, like playing chess or driving a car or other intellectual pursuits, uh, the computer is finding it easier. 
you want to stop here any quick thoughts suggestions anybody is welcome to unmute yourself so, um, what are you saying there i mean what we find easy the computer finds hard with the computer what we find hard the computer finds easy so what is the conclusion um i, I mean like why is it so why did so the way to ask this question is how did we learn to walk so easily how did we learn to bike within a week why is the computer going to take so much programming to bike whereas the car well, is so much easier have muscles for one thing i mean it it doesn't need muscles it's going to have other sources of locomotion like wheels that could get it balanced so what is this act of balancing why did humans learn it same thing with swimming or playing tennis why is that taking longer for the computer the answer may be we took several million years to become good at this now even before we became humans we were able to move around and get food for ourselves so the animal world has a common pool of genes that has been transmitted for millions and millions of years so that genes that we now call as instinct as soon as we are born we have so many skills those skills is taking longer for the computer to master it's not saying it's impossible it's just taking a little longer maybe another couple of decades but it's getting there too these new skills that we see the game called the tennis has been around only for 200 300 years so the actual rules of the game the computer is can easily master but the human skill of moving and serving and running around the court it's going to take longer does it make sense just the intellectual aspect of it has been around only for a few thousand years maybe but but i guess what i'm wrestling with is the implication of that you know um the good implication is the computer is not yet doing everything we are doing and it is because of some basic issues the computer is trying to sort itself through like uh, the qualia that's what i showed earlier the experiential aspect of life so problem solving it is great the experience aspect of the intuitiveness of human consciousness it's not yet able to perceive so that's where it is because it takes so much more computing and we have it intuitively whereas the computer has to learn it through its own algorithms we are trying to teach it <laughs> it is getting smarter make sense marlon yes yeah i see one more question oh, i was good. on the yeah, phone yeah dr chuckling i'm in the, in the chat fantastic thank you i was on the phone for 15 minutes with a operator with my internet provider just trying to access tech support human agent representative human being the a prevented me for 15 minutes of in a loop of inane questions i finally hung up and called back asked for new service and got a human being for tech support is this what we have to look forward to the future so now we are dealing with the narrow artificial intelligence so the it is also still being programmed by humans who want to minimize uh, man power time because they have to pay the uh, rep to answer our questions so if the computer can solve some issues they want to uh, minimize their uh, bottom line costs that's what we are facing as the customer but as the intelligence of the computer gets more and more the tech support we may prefer the computer <laughs> to the human being because a lot of times the computer may be smarter in the next 5 years at solving these challenges that we face while booking airline tickets or for whatever tech support that we need the computer a cannot problem solve ask pertinent questions or find solutions so those are the limitations that the current narrow ai based systems are still faced with things are getting better too fast <laughs> that is what we are seeing with the computer any anybody else has any thoughts on their interaction with ai anybody who has um, spoken so far this is judith um where would you put today self driving cars in that uh linear um graphic that you had before so that depends on which car we are talking about well, let's go for tesla <laughs> yeah tesla can do it <laughs> there's no <laughs> doubt about it and i think they're already testing cars uh, by themselves and uh, 
not only tesla there are several other companies doing it several universities doing it uh, i one of my nephews he spent the last 10 years i think is in ohio where he's researching this and he told me last year five years from now uh, there won't be a need for us to actually drive a car that's what he says yeah. five years from now and he said that last year so that's what he believes people in that field really are very optimistic and uh, still there are, there are a lot of regulations we are still as human beings afraid to give up control of the steering wheel and that may be some of the reason but if you look at uh, motor vehicle accidents on the road uh, computer driven cars already have ex- extremely low accident rates they do still have some accidents that they are trying to figure out how to overcome but already their numbers i think are lesser than human um, by several fold so still we haven't allowed them to take to the roads because uh, we are skeptical about it if you do the math already they overcome uh, human level of error so that's where things are already they feel uh, like uh, trucks that transport huge amounts of uh, goods uh, for so many hours they are on the road that entire industry uh, may not need uh, drivers to drive the trucks around so the current roads current uh, trucking uh, systems once they become ai driven the, it just won't need the driver and the driver needs after 10 hours of driving 8 hours of sleep or they need to switch between drivers one goes to sleep that entire system won't need they just go get gas and keep going till their destination is reached that's what's going to happen is one of the predictions and so the economy will... structure will completely change yes yeah, so now we are moving from uh, the science to the implications so then we can mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot is happening and it's happening in our lifetime if this type of conversation was to happen 200 years ago 2000 years ago the differences would have been so minuscule that it would not matter for several generations whereas now we are talking about in the next 5 years what's going to happen so the scale of change is just transformed so much what took 5000 years is now taking 5 years it's because it's all driven by the computer and driven by narrow artificial intelligence we look at it with irritation because it's taking another 15 minutes of our time on a customer service phone call but it's only learning so much faster the next 500 times that it delays us for 15 minutes it's learning so much more and it's getting better and they are already employing those systems so that we are allowing them to learn on their own any other thoughts before we keep moving The only thought I had is I'm kind of looking forward to some of it because I think it can lead to independence as well, especially as I age. If I can have a self-driving car, then I can still have a car. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. One of the signs of humans uh, losing our ability to move and fe- be free is not being able to transport. So if the car will do that safely for us definitely. people will be more mobile as we continue to get uh, older in age that's very true if we move to it i'm looking at a note roger is the one who only, uh, only types doesn't talk to us so i'll try to read those comments if we move to a totally automated society what will occupy human life activities <laughs> so uh, Uh, Raja's questions are so <laughs> on the dot. So that's what we want to keep discussing today for the next one hour, I think we have. We just started. Oh, okay, it's already 10 o'clock. Yes, Raja, we are going to talk about that. What will humans do if everything can be done by the computer? So this is the intelligence staircase. Are we happy that we are smarter than the chimpanzees? We should be, right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, the chimpanzees would be having this uh, zoom call and we'll be in the zoos <laughs> likely we are not in the zoo or the forest we are the ones sitting in the computers and thinking about our intelligence and artificial intelligence that we are building to enable us more the chicken unfortunately is several levels below the chimpanzee right and the ant that the chicken eats 
is way below the chicken so it doesn't have the ability to move or design or do whatever the chicken does and the chimps they have a beautiful social life like humans and we are still way better than the chimpanzees so this ladder only keeps getting better this human ladder encompasses common human beings up to einstein or the 200 iq super intelligent people all of us are still at this ladder maybe the super most intelligent will be one ladder above us okay but all of us are by and large roughly around here compared to the chimpanzee so how far does this intelligence staircase go now do you see where the human being is the human beings are still here do you see my arrow so the scale has only gotten bigger the picture is the same picture and that is where the artificial super intelligence can be very very soon once it crosses that singularity point getting from where it is to where it can be it's going to take it only a very short amount of time so people asked where are we in this time scale 1900 this question did not even arise we were living a very peaceful human driven life for 200000 years by that word homo sapien human being we the word itself homo sapien means uh, self aware that's what that word means so we claimed we are wise beings <laughs> that's what we gave ourselves the label 200000 years we've lived and at least for 10000 years we've done agriculture and uh, that allowed many of us to move in to live in cities and build music science language culture religion everything that we built in the last 10000 years and until 1990 that way of life continued but in the last 50 years that we've had computers things changed we start going to the moon we want to go to the mars and by 2000 we already have ai based systems starting to evolve in 2020 lot of our homes we have uh, all these ai driven systems in our phones and apps and whatever and the median prediction is by 2040 we'll reach singularity and uh, super artificial intelligence is only 20 years from that point so that's what is the median expert opinion people uh, working in this field that's what they are predicting in 20 uh, 2100 which is 80 years from today where we will be really nobody can predict because once these things happen these things are going to make it so different how the entire game changes and uh, the playing field itself changes so the rules will also keep changing so what will this look like we've been worrying about the end of the world not recently for 500 years we've been talking about it how uh, end of the work wh- what uh, human beings will do once this comes once that comes but now we are really at a point where most of us may not have much to do and this is what i, I just found it in the internet 14 principles of the future work force what they are trying to tell us is uh, so many different aspects where teams will be smaller work forces will be more connected people will have to be more creative uh, focus on want instead of need and uh, adapt to changes faster quickly innovate much of work will be through the cloud yeah. women will play a much bigger role uh, structures will be different and democratizing learning shift from profit to prosperity employee and management futures will be much different so all these things they are predicting and if you look at current work what it is is the first half of our life we are educating first 25 years then for 50 years we are working and then from the age of 75 we retire and uh, relax that is how life is so next what is going to happen is we'll still be in schools and colleges for 25 years but then the work life itself will keep on changing first few years working going back to learning working learning working learning for several times maybe about five times in a human beings working life and then again retiring at 75 so this is what they are predicting will happen working for a little longer but uh, working in different areas because the world is going to change we will have to adapt to that world that is what is the prediction for the future
Since we don't know that future that clearly, we are making some predictions. And then this is another thing that we have to confront. Uh, physical work which uh, involves just doing routine things and typically work that pays lesser amount, much of it is going to be quickly replaced with computer-based systems. Why are corporations eager to replace humans with computers? It's very simple. They want to make profits. That's what the company is about. Their uh, stock market-driven uh, share uh, basis, all these things is based on a uh, revenues, annual uh, income, to reduce their cost, they're going to reduce employees and rather give it to the computer. It's nothing personal. That's how the corporate world works. So if the intermediate uh, skill, a third of it can be replaced, but in uh, higher paying jobs that require college education, more and more training, we feel computers will take longer to replace. I see a chat. It appears that the Amish people will continue to live simple agrarian lifestyle based on farming. They have everything life requires in their activities. So now we want to fall back to uh, uh, older ways of life. Beautiful, Rajas, I agree with you. So this is the future. Yes, Marilyn, I see you want um, to say something. Uh, when we first got computers, um, I was working at the university and we were told that um, it would make our lives easier. Our lives would be easier because computers could do more and we wouldn't. But that isn't what happened. What happened was we got more work because the computers made it possible for us to do more in the same period of time. So it did not make the working life easier. It made it more difficult. Where, you know, we might be doing one person's work, then with the computer, we're doing one and a half person's work. And then with the better computer, we're doing two person's work. So that could also happen in the future, couldn't it? Excellent, definitely. We don't know the future. No. <laughs> We're already working harder than our prior generations. If you go back to our great grandparents 100 years ago, in a day, they would have made eight decisions. They would have done some work. And by evening, they would have been comfortable. The electricity wasn't even around for more than 100 right. years. Right. So by the time sunsets, if they choose to do some work in the light, they would. But most other people would just uh, chat around and go to sleep. That's about it. So now we are already doing so much more work at the individual level. And just because the computers are around, it's not like they're going to give us more free or leisure time. Life is well, going to get faster. Well, that's what you're saying from, the, from that prediction, though, that we would have you know, we would work so much and then we would have this time off and we would, and we Not don't. Time. We wouldn't have time off. We will take time out of our work life to go and pay and learn newer skills to come back to the workforce oh. better every time. Oh, so okay. it's not like we get a break five times in our working <laughs> life. Then, you know, that wasn't a break. That was going back to school, starting from scratch. <laughs> uh, well, yes, I guess we have to. So like I've been a cardiologist now for 15 years, then I have to go back to school and become an engineer and then go back to school and become a chef like that. <laughs> Depending on what the world needs, trying to retrain myself to fit to the world. So what, uh, any other quick thoughts? So the next, yes, one more chat. It appears, yeah, or consider the life in the ashram, simple periods of uh, life skills balanced with meditation and exercise to achieve enlightenment. So the job there is achieving enlightenment. These practices have been done for thousands of years. Why is enlightenment not sufficient or satisfying? Wow, Rajas. This, uh, I wish you also chat with us. I guess you're not able to, and that's why you're typing this in. Because people, who, I think, would prefer to actually have this conversation with you rather than me reading it. To answer this one question, I'll have to come out of this rest of the slide sets and uh, we can keep on talking about that. So 
this the other questions that rajas has been asking we been trying to sort of say it will be addressed in today's session this last sentence about uh, meditation and uh, our way of life for thousands of years and is there something beyond enlightenment that we will continue to discuss for the next three mondays so that's what is our uh, entire discussion with using siddha wisdom artificial intelligence the climate change and the last thing putting all of this together in the fourth uh, meeting so we will continue to come back to this i promise excellent any other thoughts before we go on with the slides okay so what we are seeing here anybody knows what it is just came out i think few months ago it's a virtual reality it's been around for several years i think uh, this might be the most recent uh, games that are coming out in virtual reality where you don't play it in your computer or in your smartphone you just put on this uh, headset and you go into that world altogether so you are basically shutting out everything else uh, all the inputs like visual and auditory so people say call your name you are not going to be able to hear it because your ear <laughs> ears are closed if somebody is walking in front of you you won't know because your eyes are in this world so this is a totally immersive experience the virtual reality headsets that are coming out now uh, i think this uh, i tried one of this a couple of months ago and uh, the scary part of this uh, video game which is like a lightsaber and you can just play and uh, hit some balls and try to Uh, keep moving forward and the balls keep coming faster you attack it with a light knife light saber and that game was so good in 15 minutes i was sweating i was panting and i was feeling exhilarated so exciting and the scary part is this is better than whatever we are sitting and discussing or doing with our mundane routine lives so that is the scary part this game is so fun <laughs> and i am a person who did not grow up in this world i'm 48 years old so i grew up in a regular world where black and white television became color television and that was wow for me in india growing up so for me this game in 15 minutes just captures my entire consciousness that's what i want to tell you and that was only 15 minutes i spent luckily i haven't gone back to it in the last 3 months so what about our next generations our children and grandchildren when they are growing up and coming in in contact with these things they are not going to want to go and learn to bicycle or swim or play tennis or whatever else we thought was fun they want to just spend all their time in the virtual world where the excitement is 100 fold magnified how can we match that with any skill set that we can teach them or any game that we can give them to participate so we have the recent iPhones the next generation smart devices will be in the head itself so that is the future in the sense they are not going to cut our brain open they'll find easier ways to connect with our head so 10 15 years from now it's not that the artificial intelligence it's going to be on its own it's going to work with human intelligence and make us from iq of 110 make our iq 130 160 maybe because of these devices being directly wired to our brain in ways that we yet don't know it's not like they're going to put this machine into our skull that won't work <laughs> but it's going to be possible in some other ways so that's the future that is uh, likely to happen so this is our heritage for the last 10000 years because we were able to grow reliably corn and maize and rice human beings secured food supply secured life but i don't have to go 10000 years i just have to go back 100 years and 90% in this country were living on farms taking care of their own food and making a living out of farm life 90% of us citizens now it is less than 1% so what happened to the 89% of people who are farming they moved to the cities so that is what is happening not only in the us but throughout the world india 
is considered an agricultural country. And India also, we see so much urbanization because India is a few decades behind Western world. But the same changes that happened in the US and UK and Canada is happening in India and other parts of Asia and then in Africa. So all these changes are happening throughout the world. It's just slightly different timelines. 90 to 1%, do you think it's a big change within a few decades? Right? So this is not driven by artificial intelligence. This is driven by uh, lesser need for manpower because mechanization of agriculture, that's all happened. Better machines, lesser people could take care of the farming. That's all happened. Anybody wants to stop me here for their thoughts? Now, coming to, we don't go back 100 years, we go into 2025. What are we going to be faced with? Whatever generation we come from, we are faced with digital screens. So digital screens means our computers, our TV screens, our smartphones. So what is the problem with that? These blue screens, they reduce our ability to sleep. They affect our children's mind and eyesight. Children means the future humanity. That's what we are talking about. People are still forming their opinion about life. And there is a risk for cancer. And uh, our, our ability to sleep goes down. And uh, our vision goes down. So many challenges for current human beings, adults in the workforce, but also our children. So that's what we are facing with these screens. Augmented reality. So I'm looking at a comment. Augmented reality can provide some uh, simulated travel, shopping, uh, physical experiences like roller coaster, space travel, mountain climbing, feeling of height or speed, but they cannot duplicate taste, smell or touch yet. So that might come in the future, but with what we already have, if we can go to the moon and if we get go on roller coasters despite a heart attack last year and despite having lost a leg or a stroke, three years ago, we can climb Mount Everest through virtual reality, why not? So I'm not opposed to virtual reality. It's just that this is such a powerful tool that we don't want to lose our next generations into that virtual reality. And we don't want them to lose touch with the reality itself. Yes, Mel. Uh, we, we thought though that people would stop going to libraries because um, books wouldn't be needed. We had everything. You can hear the books, you can read them on Kindle and people would stop liking books, but we haven't, which I think is a positive thing. I mean, we, we might be able to go, I might be able to climb Mount Everest, like I never do it myself, but someone who could do it themselves would probably still try it. I hope so. <laughs> our human desire to accomplish and get better. What you say is very true, Marilyn. I just hope that the future generations still find it exciting enough to want to hike. It doesn't have to be Mount Everest. It can be our local uh, park <laughs> or trail. It, uh, but I, I just wish that future generations continue to be inspired by simple things that uh, we have experienced. So I want to show some research that I just picked up uh, yesterday. What the study says is uh, defining what is screen usage. So screen usage is for social media, gaming, and group gaming, and finally watching television. So social media means chatting online, visiting networks like Facebook. Gaming alone means playing video or computer games just by yourself. Group gaming is playing computer games with friends or others who you may not know them, but playing it as groups and watching television. So this is how this study defined screen use. And what they found is when people spend more than two hours per day on social media, it increased risk for depression. This study was done, I think, in Sweden. Yes. Okay. The other things 
did not increase depression. Gaming did not increase depression. And there was another study which I didn't bring today where they looked at uh, reading. Reading hours, the actual book has not actually gone down despite the dramatic increase in computers. That's what Malin was trying to tell us, which is a welcome thing. People still like to read books, at least until 2022. Any thoughts on this? People are aware that social media more than two hours increases depression, right? Now we go to what's happened in the US more recently. This is a census done in 2015. What it says is tweens below the age of 12 years and teens up to the age of 18, what they are spending is not two hours, which is needed to cause depression. They are spending six to nine hours on the computers every day in social media, entertainment. And this is not schoolwork. It's not academic. They're just choosing to spend this extra time on their device. So where is this eight to nine hours coming from? It's coming from time they could have spent with actual friends sitting and talking to them or with their family or eating or playing sports or walking in the park or just sitting and looking at the stars. So that is where that time is coming from. And from sleep, probably. They're cutting down on sleep time to be able to get whatever fun they can or information or whatever they're trying to do with the social media. We don't even know what our <laughs> children want to do with social media because that is evolving with their needs. And our generations who grew up pre-smartphones and the social media, we don't use it just as much as these younger generation are being drawn towards. I'm happy to stop here for your thoughts. The comment is, isn't it crucial for humans to have physical touch, hugs, social face-to-face -face visiting to be happy and feel safe and comfortable? So this is so important for us as human adults. It is 100 times more important for our young children who are 5, 10, 15 years of age, when their mind and their body is still evolving and they are forming their perception, not only of the outside world, but of themselves as human beings. How can we emphasize it more? That is why we want to discuss it today. But we can only discuss and try to encourage our own children to do this the right way. I've heard that in Silicon Valley, where they come up with the latest technologies and social media that uh, that is groundbreaking, when they send their children to school, they send them to expensive private schools which uh, prohibit any uh, device usage. <laughs> so people in the field understand the importance of watching out for our next generations. We have to watch out for ourselves and our next generations throughout the world, not only in the Silicon Valley where they send to these expensive schools. Any other quick thoughts before we keep moving? Now we'll shift little gears to a little bit of history. This slide also I picked up yesterday. This one slide shows several important things about our prehistoric heritage. Our closest relatives end up being the chimpanzee. And if you look at how much DNA we share with the chimpanzee, it is 99%. There is only 1% of our DNA that is different compared to the chimpanzee. Otherwise, we are so, so similar. What about the common rhesus uh, macaw monkeys that are small monkeys throughout the world? We see them. We share 97.5 DNA with them. They look so different from us, but we are so similar. So that's what this uh, evolutionary study shows. And this uh, break happened about 25 million years ago from the rhesus monkey. About 7 million, 6 million years ago, we separated from the chimpanzee. If you go back 8 million years, the ancestors were exactly the same between us and the chimpanzees. So some things happened and then those changes continued to uh, in, enhance. And then we ended up as human beings only 200,000 years ago. So in this curve, 200,000 years is just very, very recent compared to 6 million years. Okay. Then when we separate from uh, uh, mice and uh, rodents and snakes and all that, that separation happened about 70 to 100 million years ago. Before that, we were all with that similar with them also. Make sense? That's what 
uh, evolutionary biology tells us. This is very staggering, right? That we and the monkey are 99% similar. Now, this is what evolution is about. So, there is a, a consciousness scale where consciousness is exponentially increased. If you look at uh, the unicellular organism becoming reactive, adaptive, attention, then executing things, emotions, and uh, self conscious uh, chimpanzees to human beings, this is a dramatic increase several hundred fold, 500 fold exponential increase. And then by the time we are adults, this is where we are. And super consciousness is going to only start here. And from there, how much higher it can go. We saw that one graph earlier. So the scale is only going to get more and more interesting in the next several decades. I want to remind us that in the last 200,000 years that we have existed as human beings, we have two ways of choosing to perceive life. One, my clan, what are my fights for, my conflicts against my neighbors. And all these 200,000 years, there has been evidence that people and groups have found it in themselves to trust and to find ways to co-live, not only with their own closest families or neighbors or tribes, but also with other tribes. And they found similarities between them and the other uh, tribes. So that also has been part of our history. So it is a choice whether to say we are Russians, we want to fight against Ukraines, or we are this, we are uh, this religion or that country or that continent or whatever we want to differentiate. So we can find reasons to differentiate or we can find reasons to say we are similar. So that choice may be the biggest difference between finding peace and happiness versus uh, more of uh, anger and aggression and conflict. So that is a choice that we can make within ourselves. So that is why I bring this information. So that last bit of transcendence, ability to go to super consciousness. What it is, is these few things that I found on the internet that I wanted to share with you. The will to find meaning in life creating something meaningful for society, receptive to the inherent beauty of the world, focus shifts from my needs and the self towards well-being of others and change for motivation of values and a steady stream of elevated emotions and morally concerned genuinely for the other's well-being. So these were the common traits in people who are able to move beyond their selfish needs and find not only success, but also deeper happiness through transcendence. So this is what it is. Maslow's hierarchy of needs initially is about taking care of our hunger, thirst, safety, shelter, homes, and then so social needs, finding a family, some friends that will be trustable. So these are the basic three levels. Once all of this is achieved, through education, through getting a job and being married and having children and having friends. After that, some people are, by this level, most people find they are already retired and their life is uh, coming to an end. But some people, luckily, if they are able to experience th this level of fulfillment sooner, they are able to work towards recognition and power and they are the people that the world recognizes as leaders in whichever field it may be politics or movies or science or whatever and then there are some people who go towards self-actualization which means even after becoming recognized in their field they don't stop they want to still continue like after winning uh, so many Wimbledons uh, Roger Federer may want to still keep playing until his legs and arms give away. So like that, the people, there is no specific end. And it's people like Einstein who wants to give their life towards science. Any field you can find people who have given their life for self-actualization. That is just maximizing their potential for the sake of uh, science itself or whatever that cause might be. And then even beyond that, Maslow did not write, talk, or mention this much, but he recognized this towards the end of his life. There is another level called transcendence. That is the level that uh, logical, psychological 
frameworks do not recognize because at that level you are doing things by giving up your own personal need for rest or sleep or even physical pain they are pushing beyond their own limits for the sake of some bigger cause and people have done that for a few minutes few hours or de- dedicated decades of their life or their entire life for causes bigger than themselves so that transcendence for helping people they don't even know that is what is uh, something he saw throughout the world but uh, he saw it only later in his life so he did not even have a chance to incorporate that and that's what is something that uh, we've been showing through our uh, heartful living programs through self inquiry people can uh, work towards despite heart disease despite their health issues and things like that so i'm going to quickly look at uh, some more comments from uh, rogers isn't it crucial for humans to have physical touch yes we discussed that most of the uh, suburbs of silicon valley is overridden by homelessness and poverty san francisco except for a few rich tourist areas is a dumping ground why is that why do people why do young people with all their devices and tech choose to vacation in national parks camping to unplug from devices so all these are uh, such important things and uh, there is a book my son kevin told me about that's uh, written recently and uh, i think uh, people in silicon valley are reading why it is not the growth in silicon valley is not uh, uh, comprehensive it's not holistic it's only in some segments of the population uh, and when the other segments are le- left behind and the cost of living and transportation uh, is become so exorbitantly high in the silicon valley the common people who make their routine uh, ways of life uh, they are not able to any more survive so how can society in the silicon valley even thrive if there is no more common people there if it's only a uh, computer specialist that's not just a good way of living maybe that's the reason why they want to go to national parks and experience the simple beauty of night sky or silence and just hiking and being connected with their own body and their outer nature that's why people not only from silicon valley everywhere need to go to the national parks but obviously from silicon valley it may seem like such a different world altogether and all of us need that definitely people in the silicon valley can benefit from it too any other quick thoughts i have only one or two more slides before we stop and then we can close out the slide set and then we can chat any thoughts on this slide before we move away from this one we are saying mass loss hierarchy of needs can be uh, overcome within our lifetime with our own will power without needing any external guidance we can do it by self inquiry that's what our uh, pa- friends and patients with heart disease have shown us in the last 7 years that we've been doing this program the one more question what is the title of the book your son is reading from silicon valley he read it already he showed it to me this is like a year or two ago i'm going to get it from him and share it with jennifer so she'll give it to our whole group so i forget the title of that book it's a beautiful read he he learned a lot from it and because he told me what it is i didn't spend the time on reading it but you're going to like it i'll get you the name soon this book i might have shown you he showed me this book too factfulness have i shown this book last session no this i think bill gates has recommended or even given it for free for all uh, students going into college he feels the world needs to know the simple truths that are written in this book and uh, that cover itself shows how the world is actually becoming a better place to live in despite so much the media tells us that so many wars so many challenges the society is facing compared to 200 years 50 years 30 years ago the world is coming out of poverty thanks to science people are not dying out of hunger anymore in many parts of india because of science and improvements in so many spheres of life humanity is actually getting much much better that's the factfulness in that book and this other book i'll find out and let you know so just like water is flowing downwards we all accept that is because of gravity 
I genuinely believe consciousness is flowing upwards. And uh, no matter whether uh, we accept it or not, we are uh, understanding life more holistically in a more integrative way. And that progress may take another 100 or 200 years, but the acceleration is so beautiful and amazing. Before that, what AI is going to do to that progression of human consciousness, it's hard for me to predict. But I feel there is a synergy where all of this can be making life more beautiful. Thanks so much. So we are done much earlier than what we thought. So we can uh, unmute. Fine, our Dr. Chakalingam. Um, yeah, did you um, want to have any conversation or should we plan to wrap up early today? I'm glad to have a conversation. I still have plenty of time. It's up to the people what they want to talk about. Yeah, I would offer if anyone has any questions or comments for Dr. Chakalingam. Dr. Chakalingam, why don't you give us a, a preview for next week's topic? Climate change, climate anxiety. That's what we want to discuss next time. Because artificial intelligence, we feel, okay, it may be happening through our willpower. Maybe we can slow it down. But climate change, you and I, can we make a difference? Or does it need the leaders of the countries or some other bigger forces to change. What is the scope of the individual in climate change? That's more specifically what we're going to discuss. And uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be fun. Did you like today's session? I think Lynn is unmuting, Lynn. Yeah. And Judith is also. So Judith, feel free after Lynn. Okay, yes, I like today's session a lot. And one of the things I wondered is, do you think this advance with artificial intelligence will come quickly enough to be useful in the climate change arena? It, it fits together, doesn't it? Yes. I'm really, really a very optimistic person. So my answer is a strong yes. It's going to happen. So we don't know how these changes are going to be. We cannot see beyond the next few years, but uh, I think the computer intelligence will come to aid us and uh, make it a much better world for the next generations. Judith, did you have something you wanted to say? Uh, yeah, the only comment I would say, if we looked at our history, like when we went from our agrarian society to more, um, of the industrial, we did kind of do a lot of bad things to our environment and we then cor self corrected them. I would say I'm more hopeful that as we've gone this, we've done bad things that hopefully we can self correct as we learn more uh, to use artificial intelligence or other mechanisms to self correct, just as we did in the industrial age. And, um, and certainly uh, we've moved a far away from, from the early stages of the industrial age to hopefully later stages of artificial intelligence, we can do better. Excellent, Judith. I also believe like you that uh, we, be, we will have a lot of chances to do way better than we are currently able to do. So Rogers was asking about uh, Amish, or other uh, primitive ways of life, whether uh, they can continue without any interference and their way of life won't be affected by this computer or by concerns of climate anxiety and things like that. Would some of us, if we had given a, a choice, would we love to have been born in a different era or in a different part of the world where life is at a very, very different pace, like the Amazon jungles or in Africa, where would we have preferred that way of life rather than this modern high-paced life? Any thoughts on what we would have preferred if we had a choice? See, we did not have a choice to where we are born and what time frame we come into this world. But if you had a choice now to rewrite your own personal history, would you have preferred a different time or different place? Any thoughts on that? I would definitely love to hear Roger's thoughts on it, but if he wants to type in there, his answer. Uh, the her, name is, her name is Debbie, by the way. Hey, Debbie. 
Uh, you can type in something there, but others, you could unmute yourself and chat. You, you'll have to unmute uh, yourself. Could you introduce your mother to us? Amma, are you able to unmute yourself and say hello to our friends? Do you have to tell us? Uh, I don't know if she's around. <laughs> I see her picture. I don't exactly. know. <laughs> she's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. She's a pathologist. She's a physician. And uh, she's now retired. And she's planning to come here in July for a month. So I'm really looking forward to spending time with her. My dad is a cardiologist. He's still practicing. So he would love to join us, but uh, he's uh, taking care of patients now. So that's why he's not with us on Zoom. Mom might unmute when she gets a chance, I'm hoping. But, but your dad will always be taking care of patients. So <laughs> if, if, if he doesn't just choose to come. Well, guys, um, I think we have a pretty good preview. Did the iPhone unmute just now? Someone who's just called iPhone may be wanting to say something. I didn't notice if you were already unmuted. Well, I think unless there are other questions or comments, I think we have a good preview for next week. Um, Kay, were you going to say something? Yes, I was. I don't oh. know if you can hear me or not. Yes, uh, we can. Um, I wanted to just follow up on our first session. I, because of this discussion, uh, we took the uh, advice and tried to do without PBS News for a week and felt like that it was very, uh, enriching not to know what was going on every day other than what we got from the regular media. So I wanted to say how we put that into practice and found that it was beneficial to, to do that for our own psyche. Um, another thing is I would like to, uh, I have a little community that I'm building here in Columbia that I would like to invite you to come visit, but could I have maybe your email to give you the details so that we could find a time where we have we're integrating the social uh, community aspect with technology with, uh, so I'd like for you to just see what we're doing here in Columbia. I just put in my email address, my last name and first initial at missouri.edu. Great. So I look forward to learning more about it. It's very exciting. And uh, I see the beautiful comment, Amish people, they don't think they are primitive which they may not be because they feel they live closer to God, which is a beautiful way of looking at it. So anybody wishes to have been born in a different time or a different culture or a different part of the world, I don't know if anybody answered that question. Could I go back to a different question? Sure, anything we can discuss. I, I'm interested... Um... Sorry, I don't know your name, the lady who was speaking about this community in Colombia. I wonder if you could tell all of us more about it. Dr. Chakalingaba, I will let you know that when you hold your mic really close to your mouth, it is a little bit, it, it almost like, we, we turned up his input, I asked him to, and now it's a little little too much. Just FYI, I'm sorry to do that. But yeah, it's Kay Wax, Jack is her husband. Um, and Kay, Lynn was asking you to talk about your community. Um, we started a new community. It's over on Ash Court in the middle of Columbia. We're building 10 houses. Um, six of them are already occupied. And the concept is where you're, you live in, uh, you own your own home, and, but you're part of a community. And we have renovated a duplex there. And half of the duplex has become a community space for the people to gather and to be together and they so you're buying into a concept that you want to live and know the people that you want you want to be socially involved based on all the benefits that you gain through life about being um, how your health and psyche and everything improves by having social and community uh, participation so that's the basic philosophy the concept is co-housing which has been in uh is not been in Colombia yet but it's been all over the United States and the world and um but we've defined it as like a pocket neighborhood so that it could get through the 
zoning and everything that's here in Columbia. So we figured out a way that we could integrate it into the existing system. But uh, if you want to read about it, the main uh, philosophy is called uh, co-housing. I think it's a beautiful and very, very welcome thing because as doctors, we are helping patients cope with blood pressure or heart disease or this or that, so many conditions with some pills that work on some specific molecules. But what you are doing is holistic. It can transform individuals' connection with life, meaning, and so deeper level that uh, you wake up in the morning wanting to not only take care of your own uh, hunger and exercise needs, but also your concern. Is he going to join with me? Is she going to be able to walk with me? That concern, connection actually makes you do better and our health can be so much better. And uh, in a whole, this is, I think, a very, very welcome change. I, I think I mentioned last week that humans are now for the first time ever in our evolution choosing to be single. We do, people are finding it harder to find a suitable person to spend their married life with. But this co-housing, many people may choose. Whether they are married or single, they may still choose this co-housing because it gives you some freedom where you go to your own space when you need to, but you can still be able to do so many things together and be really concerned and directly connected with people rather than the through the social media and this blue screens. Excellent. I'm definitely yeah. going to come and visit your uh, space yeah. with my wife. It. We've taken it a step farther too because we've made sure that they all have uh, uh, solar powered. So they're all, so that we're doing a lot of sustainable activities. They're all done with uh, materials that don't, won't wear out. So we're taking it a step further in terms of uh, trying to uh, be very conscious of what we're doing to the environment as well as the benefits that we're getting from it socially and uh, for the community. So we're we trying to integrate climate change into the, the concept for the future. Beautiful. I'm so glad you shared this. We applaud you and uh, thank you for your initiative. So this is the way of the future. <laughs> These small changes that happen, but with the right intention that others will uh, recognize the value of it and uh, benefit from these sort of uh, ways of moving forward. Congratulations on your beautiful effort. Thank you. Oh, I I've forgotten your first name, Mrs. Wax. Um, what about diversity in that community? Or, um, how does that work? Uh, the concept is open to anybody that wants to live in the com community, but they have to agree that they want to be a part of a community, uh, but they own their own homes. Um, the, the people that are participating so far, we have um, different age groups from about 50 to 75. There's a mixed, uh, we have other racially people. We have a person that has adopted children, so has young children. So, um, so there is diversity. Yes, it's whatever spontaneously happens. We have no uh, pre preconceived ideas of who can live there, but that is, that is just spontaneously occurring, yes. Good, good. Mm -hmm. It's on Ash Court over off of West Boulevard. If anybody wants to drive through, they're welcome to come visit and just have a look around and see what, how we're putting this in the middle of Columbia and how we were able to uh, cre create this or develop this in, in what a pre-existing community. So it's uh, right on the corner of West Boulevard and Ash. And uh, so just drive in there and look around and just visit us. It's right down the street from where I live. I live in that neighborhood. Um, and my dog and I will walk down that that block every once in a while, Kay. And it's it's fun to see the changes. And, you know, more. I was there right when the street was put in and now all the houses. So it's exciting. It is very exciting. Okay, well, Dr. Chakalingam, um, we look forward to the next lecture on climate change and how it relates to uh, what you've been teaching us. Um, I will, Dr. Chakalingam will share the uh, slideshow 
with staff and we'll get that up on the course documents page uh, later this week. This the first slideshow is already there. I hope you know how to access the course documents page. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom of your confirmation email, the same one you used to get into the Zoom today, we have a link to the course documents page. So please visit that. Dr. Chakalingam, I will send you the Zoom recording link so you can put it on your website. I also will share highlifejourney. Is it org or com? Or anyway, uh, I'll I'll share Dr. Chakalingam's website as well on the course documents page later this week. That has links to some of the classes that he taught earlier uh, for OSHA and for other groups. Uh, you have recordings there, so um, so watch for that later in the week on the course documents page. Anything else, Dr. Chakalingam, before we let the class go today? Amazing! Thanks so much. I thoroughly enjoyed this discussions today. All right. Thanks, Marilyn, for your text. Thanks, Debbie, for all your uh, your chat messages. And we hope the rest of you are enjoying your day. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone.